Welcome to Thursday Artist Talks, presented by the Surrey Art Gallery Association, also known as SAGA, in partnership with Surrey Art Gallery and with support from the Arts Council of Surrey. In Surrey, many of us stand on the traditional and unceded territory of the Salish peoples, including the lands of the Keitsi, Kwantlen, and Semiamun First Nations. As you may know, we present these events at Surrey Art Gallery on the first Thursday of each month. Today, we're going live for the first time using Zoom with closed captioning and ASL interpretation. Captions are currently enabled, and to turn off captions at the bottom of your screen, depending on your device, you can either click the button which says live transcript or the button that says more, then click the option hide subtitle in the pop-up menu. If you have further questions, please go to the chat and connect with Avishka from the gallery. This meeting is also being recorded. My name is Joanne Dennis, and I am the past president of SAGA. SAGA is a nonprofit member-based society dedicated to supporting Surrey Art Gallery. Proceeds from our fundraising efforts contribute to gallery exhibitions, publications, programs, and projects. We also raise funds through our gift shop and art rental programs, which include an online platform that gives you access to the works of our talented artist members. SAGA membership is made up of artists and art-interested people and organizations throughout the Lower Mainland. Having membership in SAGA is a good way to support local artists and encourages public education in the visual arts. To learn more about our programs or to become a member, go to our SAGA website, sagabc.com. During this event, the audience microphones will be muted, and, but you can still post your questions in the chat window. Alana from the gallery is supporting the tech, so please connect with her through the chat for any challenges and troubleshooting. Your questions for the artists will be introduced at the end of the event, if time permits, and we will be streaming video during the event. So a quality connection is preferable for best viewing. This event will be approximately one hour in duration. Now I will introduce our speakers for today. We have Zachary Longboy. He's a video maker and performance installation artist born in Churchill, Manitoba of Sayisi Dene lineage. Longboy places his multiple identities as a white adopted native gay two-spirit 60s scoop survivor at the center of his multidisciplinary practice. His intensely felt hybrid layered videos often uses complex performance installations as a departure point. Longboy is nationally honored and widely known in queer and First Nations venues, as well as in public collections at the National Gallery of Canada, Winnipeg Art Gallery, Glenbow Museum, and the Canada Council Art Bank. His work has been screened at numerous locations, including Edmonton Art Gallery, Museum of Modern Art, and Images Festival. You can view Zachary's other works through his Instagram handle at Zachary Cameron Longboy. Justin Ducharm will be joining Zachary for discussion today. Justin is a writer and filmmaker from the Métis community of St. Ambroise on Treaty 1 territory. He was selected as a fellow in the Sundance Film Festival's 2022 Native Film Lab with his television pilot, Positions, based on a short film of the same name. Justin was a recipient of the Toronto International Film Festival's Barry Avich Fellowship and is an alumni of their 2021 Filmmaker Lab. His writing has been featured in Canadian Art, Room Magazine, Prism International, and Filmmaker Mag. He currently lives and works on unceded Coast Salish territory. Now we will move on to begin Zachary's first video called From Another Time Comes One, followed by Running, then Water Into Fire. The fourth video is called Standing, and, is, and the last one is Guardian of Sleep. Before the videos are shared, feel free to hide the subtitles in the Zoom meeting to prevent double captions. The shared videos have already been captured on YouTube. 
After the screening of the videos, Zachary will speak, followed by conversation between him and Justin. So without further ado, let's begin. We're told today that our reputation as a tolerant people is now in doubt. In his annual report, Canada's Human Rights Commissioner, Max Yalden, says the country is becoming racist in its treatment of minorities. It's the plight of Aboriginal people that the Human Rights Commission calls a national tragedy. It cites a denial of basic rights to people like Donald Marshall. And it says Native people are trapped between a traditional world that is dying and a modern one that still shuns them. Native leader George Erasmus questions whether the report will do any good. We have heard these statements many, many times before. We wonder if the government's going to do anything about it. The Human Rights Commission says Canadians should celebrate human rights advances won through political reform in Eastern Europe. And Canadians should continue to work for similar advances throughout the world. But the Commission also says Canada's commitment to international human rights will be meaningless unless there is real respect for diversity within our own borders. Denise Harris and CBC News, Ottawa. A resolution tonight to a story we ran last week dealing with racism. I didn't grow up under a reserve. I grew up um, with no identity. I was forced into uh, believing in a Catholic religion, <clears throat> and right from the beginning I knew I was different, um, in the sense that um, I was a Métis, class, classified as a Métis, but yet I never really fit with the white man, and I never really fit with the Indians, and we were never ever treated as part of, even when we would have our like drum dances and potlucks, uh, or potlatches, and we were never ever sort of like involved <clears throat> and even um, all members of my family, like my grandmother, my grandfather, my mother, my dad, um, they all spoke like three languages. None of that was carried through with, with any of the kids. Uh, one of my older sisters um, can speak a bit of the language. sounds very selfish but being you know being raised the way I was and I was sort of raised to be away from her and growing up I don't know it was something like that sober it was something I realized I used to call her just a drunken old squaw and then I got sober and I was in a meeting one night and uh, talking about Indians and being a drunken Indian I would never admit to anybody that was an Indian and one night I was in a meeting and I just broke down and cried because I realized that I was calling her this drunken old squaw and I thought, well, what makes me any better? Mm -hmm. 
I think I'm, I've spe I'm spending all my time right now trying to teach people about it because it's so strong within me. Um, I could I could have pretended when I was small, when I was going to residential school, that I wasn't Indian and I was ashamed of being Indian. But um, it never went away. It was the only thing that I had to fall back on as a, as I got older. And. Um, my life in black right now. And Tanaman spoke. I know that the pale faces are a proud and hungry race. I know the claim not only to to have the earth, but that the meanest of their color is better than the wisest of the red man. But let them not boast before the face of the Manitou too loud. They entered the land at the rising of the sun, and may yet go off at its setting. A man standing on a hill, rooted to the skin, holding a bucket filled with stones. 
Each stone marks a dream and celebration of truth. I was raised by mother, mom, mommy, family. A man standing I met the mother, mom, the mommy, family. Holding a bucket filled with Knowing stones. where I fit has never been my strong Each point. Marks a dream and celebration the dream of is truth. filled with dance and song, I was raised lasting into the late night. Mom. A man standing I'm on a hill. She's alive. Yes, she's alive. They're alive. Holding a bucket filled with stones. alive. She's alive. No He's alive. Dream marks a dream and celebration of truth. Running, running. Trees go by. Raised by mother. Mom. Mommy. A man standing on a hill. Rooted to the skin. Running, running. Holding a bucket filled with stones. Each stone marks a dream and celebration of truth. I was raised by mother, the dream is filled with dad's mommy, family, lasting until the late night. I met mother, mom, I'm alive, mommy, she's alive. family, he's alive, they're alive. Knowing where I fit has never been my strong point. She's alive, he's alive, the We're dream alive. is filled with dance and song, running, running, lasting until the late night. I'm alive, she's alive, he's alive, they're alive. I'm alive, she's alive, he's alive, trees are alive. I am standing on a hill, running, running, to the sky. by. Holding a bucket filled with stones. Running, running, trees go by. Each stone marks a dream and celebration of trees go by. I was raised by mother, mom, mommy, family. A man standing I met hill. mother, mom, mommy, family. Holding a bucket filled with Knowing stones. Knowing where I fit has never been my strong Each point. Stone marks a dream and celebration the dream is filled with dance and song. I was raised lasting by into the late mom. night. A man standing on a hill. She's alive. Yes, she's alive. They're alive. Holding a bucket filled with stones. I'm alive. She's alive. No He's alive. Stone marks a dream and celebration of truth. Running, running, trees go by. Raised by mother, mom, mommy, a man standing on a hill, rooted to the sky. Running, running, trees go by. Holding a bucket filled with stones. Each stone marks a dream and celebration of truth. I was raised by mother, the dream is filled with dad's mommy, family, lasting until the late night. I met mother, mom, I'm alive, mommy, she's family. He's alive. They're alive. Knowing where I fit has never been my strong point. She's alive. He's alive. The dream is filled with dance and song, running, running, lasting into the late night. I'm alive, she's alive, he's alive, they're alive. I'm alive, she's alive, he's alive, trees are alive. Running, running, trees go by. Running, running, trees go by. Running, running, trees go by. I couldn't even begin to tell you where we left off. No. Oh, icons. All right. How long have you been HIV positive for? You know, I'm not sure, but I think it's about five or six years. And then how long have you been on AZT? Three. AZT, um, DDI, DDC, and then there's something else in there. It was horrible. That's all I remember. <laughs> Describe some of the symptoms.
We sat and talked for uh, a good two hours. At one point, he pushed a crumb across my face. It's so natural. <laughs> he kept saying that he was ready to die. I kept thinking, I don't know if I'm ready for you to die. He said it was like climbing a ladder. And I thought that was pretty ironic, since I was supposed to do something about a ladder. He didn't know where he was climbing to, if it was up or down, or if the ladder was lying flat. But he knew he was going somewhere. This is really the last time that we're going to see each other. It's going back home. It's hard to uh, imagine him not being around. But uh, I've got some good memories.
feel like that more and more every day as well. My mother's child. Wave your glasses in the air. <laughs>
a vision of paradise, a place of desire. I walk through an untouched garden, birds sing, waters flow close by, searching, body marked by scars of reality. Surrender to the emotion of trust, have sight into joy, feel the insanity of need, cleanse your soul. I stand in the arena of confusion, putting my heart in your hand. Caress me gently, expect a change. Ride the waves that follow. Sit by a lit candle. Look into your eyes. Use your voice. Dream. I ate and I ate and I ate. Beauty. What a beast am I. Amongst the creatures I still survive. I make room for you. You make room for me. Here is my soul. Standing beside along with. Here is my past. Standing beside along with. Here is my breath. Standing beside along with. Here is my dream. Standing beside along with. Hey, thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for that, Zach. How's everybody doing? I see some hands waving in the camera. Um, thank you so much for having me uh, be a part of this evening. Um, I'm super grateful to be here and share space uh, with Zachary. Um, we've we've worked together on a few things um, now, and I'm always really grateful to uh, to reignite this collaboration. Um, everybody always says this intergenerational collaboration, but I feel like we're contemporaries. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Zach, um, some of the work tonight uh, that you shared was were, were new videos, uh, new works that came out this year. Um, so I guess jumping off from your new piece, Guardian of Sleep, um, and the previous one before that, um, where does your inception or I guess first idea begin with pieces like that? Um, and how do you find that your concepts uh, come together? You start off with some drawing or smudges on paper, paint. You start off that way, and some, this, the last piece, Garden of Sleep, started off as a dream. And then I began animating my drawings. And they just kind of float into themselves. Nice. How much do you find um, writing poetry informs your work as a filmmaker? Because I know you to be, I know you to be quite an avid writer. And in the times that we've worked together, I feel like you've brought so much, um, so much writing to the table every time. And it makes me curious about how much um, how much does writing like that inform your practice as a filmmaker? Because I know you and I have had private conversations about the ways in which I find poetry fuels my career as as a as a writer, as a screenwriter, or even a filmmaker. But coming from this place of, I guess, multi hyphenate practice because I mean you're talking about drawing and and these visuals and this writing so where does that writing come in and do you find yourself um do you find yourself being picky about what you share in regards to what you what you're writing poetry wise when it comes time to filmmaking yes very much so I scared of speaking words I I know my words, I'm fearful of them because of the power the words have. And I don't see myself as a filmmaker. You know, I, don't, I, I never really shot film other than, other than a little bit in From Another Time Comes One, the shot of the school children mm -hmm. dancing at the, the end of the film. It's the only film, but only film I've ever shot. So it's I don't know if I'm a video maker or I just like to make images that flow into each other. And so I, 
I find the words, they, they start at different points, like in each, each different film, film or video that I've made. I sometimes start off with words. Most of the time I start off with drawings. I bring it to the paper and then paint it. And I have to make it come from, from the paper, make it 3D. So that could be either me dancing or um, I once, once made totem sort of flowers, totem poles or sticks or dried flowers. And that, that was a way of getting the images off with the paper up, up into the live, something more tangible. It's, paper being 2D doesn't always feel like, sometimes it feels like you can dive in, but he still doesn't, doesn't have that movement to it. So I like to build them up, build them up. Yeah, I love that practice of of turning your, and I remember we've, we had this conversation when we did uh, the Running Running Trees Go By show, but I love this idea of, of finished work becoming an entirely other piece um, through that animating that you do. I feel like it's such a brilliant way to mix these practices that you have of painting and drawing and being a video maker. Um, I'm curious, I feel like one of, one of my favorite things about your work and I feel like one of the things that we connected on very quickly when we met, um, obviously our shared identity is as queer indigenous men, but I feel as though you have this ability to blend these deeply personal roots of story within this almost dreamlike digital um, voice uh, pace that you've be able, been able to develop. Do you find yourself needing to um, strike a balance between where you where you go more into the personal aspects of things or where you tend to be more dreamlike because i feel like you manage to meet at this really great um medium ground where i feel like you're keeping yourself safe um but also giving so much to the audience and to your your viewers to chew on. So I'm just curious if that's something that you think about. Um, also, I'm sorry for everybody who's just meeting me. Zachary is very used to my rambling, but. <laughs> One of us has to. <laughs> I, I, when I think about, when I think about drawing, and I think about, it's trying to make those things match, trying to be personal. And trying to show a, a personal work about my feelings. It's a real, it's a battle to not be overindulgent. I, I'm fearful of being overindulgent. It's, it's, it's all, they're all about me. The story is about me. And that in itself is very self indulgent. But I also feel as though it's, it's a voice that hasn't necessarily been heard. Um, 60 Scooper Survivor, um, families being bro broken up. These are things that we're only now hearing about. I never, never heard about that stuff in, when I was in school. And it's only stuff that's now coming up now. So I feel it's a real battle to be personal with my images, but not not too personal, and I, mm -hmm. I tend to layer pull layers off myself. And that's why I did so much stuff in the nude in the nineties. I, I felt fear of the skin being exposed. Do you 
just sorry this just popped into my mind thinking of of your work in the 90s and specifically some of your uh performance pieces um that i've been uh lucky enough to see um through the uh the archive at grunt um but do you was there always a marriage between performance art and video making or did those did those two things sort of just coincide because of the natural i guess way of 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 filming performance art or was it always a conscious um decision to make videos based on these performances that you did I think the performances came first, and when I got the footage of the videos, of the video of the performance, I tried to make a story out of it, and then I always end up not liking parts of it, so we had to reshoot it and try different ways to make it speak. Right. Or that failed as we were making it, but. <clears throat> It's, I find that when I'm performing, I'm able to speak directly and just to, to make it live longer in the film is hard because it's not, it's not, it doesn't have the immediacy of a performance, the emotion. So, I mean, for the Stone Show, the, the performance was completely different than the end of the product, which was about my grandmother and the family. But it was originally an angry piece about being placed in a place where we, were, we get places as Indigenous people, Two-Spirit people. It was a real anger piece, and it was. I wanted to express that anger without bashing people over the head. Hmm. But it didn't really work until until you re-edited it, and it was it was something I couldn't look at for quite some time. You know, when you re-edited it, I, I remember I didn't speak to you for the few hours after you edited it because I was shocked. I was it was not something that I saw, and I had to rethink, had to reevaluate that piece. And you put so much energy in, into a performance, and when it doesn't work. The energy's got to go somewhere, and it was interesting to try to make a film, a video from that performance and how it morphed. Yeah, you know, I have to say that nothing that I've ever started to make it never ends up looking the way it's, it was originally started. It's always something completely different, and I've always felt that that was my failure. It's, you know, you, you write a script or an idea and you don't stick to it and you color outside the lines kind of thing. Um, I, I'm notorious for coloring outside the lines. I don't, I don't follow scripts well. And I think that's part of, part of just the way that I, I deal with things. I think it's also what makes your work so compelling <laughs> and interesting. I think having somebody who isn't afraid to throw that handbook out um, and sort of forge your own path. I feel like it's, that's part of the reason why we connected so um, quickly when we, when we finally did meet. Um, and for those, uh, who may not be aware, I um, I re-edited uh, an older performance uh, from, 
I believe the nineties that Zach did, uh, the stone show. And I had taken it, um, I'd taken the footage, the film footage, actually, that Grunt Gallery had, and I recut it into this sort of dreamlike, um, very fluid, um, almost almost music video. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and it it became something something totally different, like he just said. Um, and I love I love hearing you talk about. I guess the immediacy of performance um, versus, I guess the the curatorial aspect of the experience when it comes time to sharing video work. Um, I think that that's something that people don't really um, think about if they haven't if they haven't been. Um, in that kind of exchange of audience and artist. Um, so yeah, that's really, that's really interesting uh, to bring up. Um, I'm curious about the film selection that we saw um, tonight. Is there, um, is there any specific, um, I guess reasoning behind the choice because I know, I know you've got quite the catalog, um, <laughs> and I feel like these uh, films fit really well together and had a really great flow. Um, so I'm curious if there was um, what 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 was behind that decision making, um, or if it kind of just came to you naturally. I think the decision was that the first one was something that I made. It was the first thing that I made. And Water to Fire was kind of in the middle. And then Garden of Sleep was the one that I just made. It's kind of, I think it was just that, that simple. Any middle and end of a bunch of stuff that I made. And then I, I made the standing and running as ways to show my drawings and add poetry to it. But I'm really losing my voice in, 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 with Parkinson's. And I don't, I'm not strong. I, don't, I, can't, I can't get the words out always. Mm -hmm. So it was a way of making sure that I didn't have to speak for an hour and a half. So it was kind of, it was selfish in that sense. <laughs> Hey, somebody's got to be. Yes. But yeah, I'm I I think it's really interesting um the ways that that you've um talked openly about adapting I guess your practice as an artist um with like conjunction with your disability and I feel like being um the level of transparency that you give um both yourself and i feel like the people uh the people you work with is um i don't know you're just really great so and you sound amazing somebody said that in the chat you sound great and you do so <laughs> um but yeah it's just such an inspiration and i I'm so grateful to have to know you and have a relationship with you because you inspire me to continue to, to make things. Uh, your hustle is very, uh, is I'm very envious of it. Uh, um, and I'm excited to see, I can't wait to see what you do next. Um, did anybody in the audience have any questions? Um, now would probably be a good time to turn over if so. Um, I think we're reaching our, our 20 minutes here. Um, but speaking of any any work, do you have any anything that you're working on right now, whether it be drawings or or any video ideas? I've been working with for the Illuminaries Festival, Light Festival Christmas. 
um, making kaleidoscopes or snowflakes that we're going to project onto buildings. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's, it's, it's just kaleidoscopes and snowflakes. So it's not a lot of emotion. <laughs> One will have to dig deep. But it's been fun to explore using color and light and, and having the opportunity to project them. Nice. I spent this fall kind of doing that. So there was a few questions. First was, um, tell us a bit more about the bucket full of stone ceremony that was being referenced in the running video. Well, I've always used stones, and it's 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 an image that I kind of used throughout different works and performances. I've had a bucket filled with stones or a bucket of grass growing. Um, it's kind of around centered around the burial practice, the burial the burial mound, in a way of kind of. I've got the stones and then I put soil over top of them and grass seeds. Grass kind of grows out from the stones. It's how we're also interconnected to life and death. It's something I'm not afraid of. I think it's part of, part of life. So it's something that I have fear and that's the kind of birth for me. Nice. Um, so follow up questions from Paul. Can you speak to the imagery of the caribou? Um, and related to that, there's a recurring theme of running, running towards or away from something. Um, are these related? And yeah, can you speak to the imagery of the caribou? Well, the caribou were the guardians of sleep. And the sleep was this place of desire, place of what I wanted to move to. And Garu were the guardians to save, keep safe that space. I always seem to have a protector in my work. And this time Garu were so large, so epic. Uh, was yeah I, I think I think the different pieces that I've made and there's always some sort of protector mm. to save the space so that I don't have to be bombarded. I kind of build these spaces or performances where I, I'm doing these angry things but I built something around the like in the Stone Show, it was the whole stage was a big ship. And that was how I protected myself from the audience that I, we were on the ship. So they're, 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 protect, they're protectors. And it was just an image that I, I felt as though I've struggled with using images from my tribe, from the size of any. Because mm -hmm. I wasn't raised with them, right? It's almost like I gave myself permission to use caribou. Mm -hmm. Especially being nor a northerner, I mean the significance that they hold—it's very vast and and very. Um, Ancestral, very deep. <laughs> um, another question here. Do you find your work um, reaching the settler and non-native community? I, I do. Mainly because I've been an infiltration of the, their communities. <laughs> I was raised a, a white boy. And I, I saw, that, saw that myself as that for a long time. I was raised by a white family and a foster family. And it's, it's, it's been a struggle for me to find myself, my Indianness, mm -hmm. to 
to admit, to relish in it. It's been a struggle to find that. So much was taken away. Okay. So much was not so natural. And it took a while to find that natural feeling that, that, that I could say was that me as being an indigenous person, it's taken a long time to, to live, it, live in it. Mm -hmm. I remember too, one of the first things that we spoke about when we met for the first time in person was sort of um, giving ourselves as artists and as people, especially queer indigenous people, um, it's giving ourselves the permission sometimes uh, because there's nowhere, <laughs> sometimes there's nowhere else to look but there. Uh, and I remember that was a really great um, piece of advice that you gave me as, as someone who was just like sort of starting out in this, in this wild industry. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, there's a comment here um, that's not a question, but it's just from Debbie who says, you said you, said you felt a bit self-indulgent, but um, she sees your work as being a selfless gift that provides insight and learning um, and thanks you very much. Uh, and I also, I agree. I think I, I remember, I remember talking to you about Water Into Fire, that specific piece and how it had been sort of um, showcased uh, in multiple spaces and multiple galleries. And sometimes people would, would latch onto it from the angle of it being about indigenous people living with HIV and others would take it from a different, a different perspective. And I feel like going back to that original comment about your work, sort of bridging these, these places of emotion and, and dreamlike, uh, almost dip takes, um, I feel like you have these multiple avenues for people to to come into your work and and find whatever piece um, in it might be for them. Um, I think that's one of my favorite things about you as an artist. Um, so I'm putting a party together and no one shows up. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's how. Um, that's one way to put it for sure. <laughs> um, I think that's it for time. Um, should we hand it back to uh, one more thing. to Joanne? Or? Yes, thank you so much, Zachary and Justin. You were uh, really put a light on some things here that I saw as well. And I'd love to give you just a little bit of feedback about these videos as I was jotting notes down while I was watching. And so when we were watching uh, the first video, I really got a sense of um, an understanding of the sense of disconnection that you felt in the community you should have belonged to. And, you know, it's interesting because I actually grew up in Dryden, Ontario, so I wasn't that far away from um, Justin's hometown. But, um, but I uh, remember, you know, as the whole reconciliation thing started and stuff, that as a young person, I didn't see any Indigenous people in my high school or my grade schools. And I thought, it never occurred to me there was something weird about that, you know, as a child. And it's just like you're saying, you know, you're, you lived an experience that, you know, you belonged somewhere else, but you didn't know how to belong. Like that's sort of what I was hearing out of that one. And so when someone had made a comment asking if you're reaching the, the non-native community, well, definitely, definitely like through that video. Um, and when I was looking at running, I was thinking about this mantra you kept saying throughout the video. And it was like, I forget what the words were already, but that's just because I forget everything. But um, <laughs> but it was the it was sense that it was like this mantra you were saying over and over in the video to reassure yourself. And it's like this sense of reassurance that it's okay, I'm gonna be okay, you know, whatever's happening is 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 happening and it and I'm you know, I can 
I can be okay kind of thing. And as I looked at Water Into Fire, that was like really powerful. It was spooky at the same time to me. It was raw, and, and but there was also a sense of release and just choosing to be. And and then, you know, then, then there was that sense of loss showing up. So all these emotions really come out in the videos. And and then in standing, it was like noticing these color changes. It's all of a sudden there's color and feeling more optimistic. And then there's this alternating moods because it's going color to black and white to color kind of thing. And and there's um, mesmerizing kind of mandalas happening. So, um, and one of the, the other things about that one was uh, watching the pregnant women moving in blue. And I noticed you had a lot of pregnant women showing up in your videos and that, that that's a question I had actually around that one but I'm going to finish with guardian of sleep because what I saw in there was it was a sense of evolving and this the earth moving and this active rumbling going on but there was also sort of a familiar and unfamiliarity to it in terms of I, I actually watched that video at the gallery and was paying attention to that quite a bit and saw your script that went with it and that whole sense of uh, the dream world where you're drifting in and out and some things make sense and some things don't make sense and um, but things kind of just move through anyways no matter what um, so it's confusing and you feel connected to it but disconnected so I really noticed that with that video especially um, but then at the end you have all these rising women and I, so so my only real question as at this point is um, the significance of the, that theme showing up in a couple of the videos around the pregnant women um, that were moving in different directions. Either it was they're coming down or they're going up or they're going in circles. <laughs> so so that's something I was just curious about. They're, they're called Himanshis. Himanshi. And they're, they're women and men that got a penis. So they're transvestites in, in a way. I've been drawing them for many years, and I, I, it's part of building my tribe. I wanted to, I didn't have one growing up, so I didn't, it was something that I, that is to me about my maleness and my femaleness, my mixture of my spirits. I, I feel there's something to, to make be part of, and I just it's, it's kind of a, an alt altruistic thing in the sense of not wanting to have men and women but combined together. So there's no room for they're combined together. There's no room for hierarchy or so. It was kind of a fantasy. Building it, building my own tribe, and and then yeah, it's the theory. Yeah, it's funny because I didn't even notice the penises. <laughs> All I could see were the pregnant bellies, <laughs> but maybe it's just the context of where I come from, right? So, and and that is the way it is with people, right? We we come at things from where we are, right? And so, what you're providing. Um, does open a door and there is a sense of okay curiosity shows up so I really appreciate the videos for that because it, it definitely gets people thinking and asking questions and really um, thinking about the experience of an individual because we you know we all have our stories we all have our place in life where uh, we have challenges and um those stories can be, when they're shared, there's more power in that because it, it just reminds us we're all human. So anyway, so I really appreciate what you guys do. It's, it's, it's beautiful work. It really is. So with that being said, do you have anything else you want to say to the audience, Zachary, before I close for the session today? I do. I just wanted to thank the Surrey Art Gallery, Surrey Art Gallery Association. And Alana Edwards, who curated this piece with Alana, thank you so much. See you up there. <laughs> thank you very much. It was really great working with her. A lot of freedom. Yeah. Alana did an amazing job setting up this, this event. So, yes, thank you, Alana. Chris, 
Chris, who, Christine, who installed the work for me, I was struggling with walking and kind of the basic things of life, and was, I didn't have the energy to to do it. So I it was really appreciative of Chris for doing that for me. And Justin, uh, thank you so much for joining me again. I feel so safe with you, and we were so connected on so many levels. I, it's such a joy to talk, talk about our practices together. Thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me down again. I'll, I'll follow you anywhere, so I got you. <laughs> In here, and a couple of other people, Francois Vaillant and Linda Duncan, who are two, two good friends who really looked after me this this last year. And John Grayson and Viral Interventions, who helped help make Guardian of Sleep. They've been they've been really. I'm a really blessed person. I get to make things and live a life that I want to. I feel quite blessed. I'm grateful for it. So thank you. Thank you for all that came here this evening. Um, I hope that I, I hope that it wasn't a waste of time. <laughs> so, you know, it was an awesome, and powerful thing you've shared today. So thank you so much. And thank you also for Jordan for being our ASL interpreter. Uh, it's kind of fun watching her on the screen too while the event was on. <laughs> So, um, so I see there's also comments here coming in uh, with some thank yous. Uh, we've got thank you so much, Justin, Zachary, and everyone involved streaming the streams and the moving, still moving word, sound, drawing, video, and image combinations to us tonight. It was powerful art. I've got Luma saying thank you for sharing. Jordan Strom saying you make such incredible work. Thank you. And Allison saying, Zachary, Justin, such a beautiful and poignant presentation and conversation. Really wonderful. Thank you both. Thanks as well, Jordan and Alana and Gallery and Saga teams. So um, everybody came together to pull this event together and, and really appreciate everybody that's been involved. So I just got a couple more items to mention before we close out. Um, Surrey Art Gallery Association, without uh, forgetting what's happening going forward, I want to make sure to share uh, the next Thursday Artist Talk is on December 1st. It is with Lynn Birale, and she will be, uh, she's a local artist who will be talking about her silk dyeing process. And we also have the Surrey Art Gallery Association, if you'd like to become a member, the, um, it's a great thing to join the annual general meeting, which is happening on November 15th. And we certainly do need more board members this year. So it would be uh, great to see some new faces showing up at that. And then we also have the Heart to Home event where we support artists with a, a holiday market. And that's happening on November 26th and 27th. So that will be at the Surrey Art Gallery. And anybody who'd like to come, you're all welcome, of course. So thank you, everyone, for tonight. It's been a pleasure uh, sitting in this room with you and being amongst giants in terms of how we express ourselves to the world. So I'm just thrilled that uh, we got to do this with you. So thank you for everything you do for the art community. And uh, we will see you around.